Hey, this is Jens from Wundercraft, and in this video, I'm going to show you how you can build a real time chat application using Next.js, TypeScript, and PostgreSQL. All right, so let's get started. We head over to the docs, then you scroll down to examples, and here's the Next.js, TypeScript, PostgreSQL real time chat example. Uh, you can find the repository here. So if you click that link, you can clone the repository, which will then look like this. And here we have some getting started instructions in the readme. So the first one is you have to install the Wunder control, so the CLI to do all the Wunder stuff. And then yarn or npm install the dependencies and finally yarn dev. So let's run yarn dev. And that starts up the database, the Next.js application and a local Wundergraph environment. If you then go over to localhost D1000, that's the default for, um, for Next.js, you should see that uh, we're currently logged in so we can log out. And you see one message from Jens at Wundergraph, so that's me. And I welcome you to the Wunder chat. So then we can use the login that uses um, the GitHub login in this case, and we can write a message. Okay, that works fine. And the other thing is we can open a second tab. You can see it also has the same messages. We can log out, log in with our second GitHub account. Hey, from second tab, submit the message. And if we log out, you see we cannot send any messages anymore, but we can still communicate, communicate back. Hello from first tab. Okay, so it seems like the application is kind of real time. And now we want to dig a bit into what actually happens here. So the first thing you notice is we have this dot Wundergraph folder. So the dot Wundergraph folder, it's all the stuff related to Wundergraph itself. And the main configuration element that you want to touch to build the Wundergraph application is the Wundergraph config TS. So that's a TypeScript file that helps you build your configuration. So what we do is we have this API called introspect and you can introspect Postgres currently, more to come. You can introspect GraphQL, Open API, or Federation. So uh, any GraphQL compatible API works. Any Open API uh, works. Uh, we can introspect the OAS file. And GraphQL Federation or Apollo Federation works as well. So you can combine multiple APIs and then introspect them to build a GraphQL server. Uh, so in, in our case here, we just have one, one API. So it's the Postgres API uh, on my local host, but you could have multiple and combine them together. So you could have a Postgres and another GraphQL API or a REST API with OAS, anything you want. In this case, it's just a Postgres database. So we have this DB object. And what we then do is we say, we want to create a new window graph application. We call this app. We pass in our DB API, and then we have this API configure window graph application where we pass our application. We define a bunch of code generators, like we want to create a TypeScript client for React. We configure a course. We configure authentication, and that's basically it. So if you have this file and you run window control up, this runs your local environment. It introspects the Postgres database and it creates a schema from that. So here's the generated schema. If you go to like type query, for example, you see we have find my messages and find users, stuff like that. Uh, if you look at the init SQL, so that's the SQL file we init the database. You can see we have the table users, we have the table messages, and then users can create messages, basically. So that's the API we 
generate here. And then the final step to actually create the whole backend, that's the window graph app operations dot graphcode file. So this file, and that's an amazing feature of IDEs, like in general, it has auto completion. So you, you can see here that uh, if we say create one messages, so that's the generated API, uh, you get back the ID message. And if you want, you could also get the user ID back from the API. It's all type safe. Uh, so we need two things to build our API. So the first one is we want to get like the last 20 messages in descending order. And we have the descending order based on ID. So ID is just the primary key, it's counting upwards. So that's our uh, our value we use for the order by. And we take 20 of those. And then we have a second mutation. And this mutation is very special. So that's the add message mutation. Uh, so it uses, internally it uses a generated function from the database, create one message or messages. Uh, we pass in some data. So we'll, for one, we pass in the message. And then we also want to attach a user to the message. And so here we can say connect or create. So either we use an existing user or we create the user. So in case you want to create this user, we pass in the name from the name variable and the email. Uh, in case the user might already exist, we look it up by using the email variable. And you can see from the creation of the database, we have a unique constraint on the email field. So this is indexed or out of the box. So that should work fine. And then there's some special things here that happen. Okay. So we have these directives at from claim, and here we can inject some claims like name, email, nickname, email verified, location, and provider. So provider is the authentication provider. So in this case, for email, we want to use the email claim, of course. Claims are name value pairs of information for authenticated users. So in this case, we need three variables to make this mutation happen. So one is email, second one is name, and third one is message. And you can say uh, email and name, those have the from claim directive attached. So that means at runtime, these variables are not available to the user. They are automatically injected by Wundergraph into the query or into the mutation, and you cannot adjust them. And this also means if you want to invoke the app message mutation, the user must be authenticated because otherwise we wouldn't have the claim. So in short, if you annotate a mutation with, or a query with the from claim directive, it makes, uh, it, it requires the user to authenticate before they can use it. And it omits the variables that are annotated with the from claim directive. And then we automatically inject email and name here. And the only variable left is message. OK. So if we look at those two messages or those two uh, queries, you can actually see that it's a fully fledged backend that we just created. It's secure because we don't expose the whole GraphQL API. We only expose those two messages. And uh, one of them requires authentication, as you can see. And now you might be asking, how do we use this? So how does it work for the client or for the developer? So if you type these two uh, queries, what Wondercraft does is we generate a type safe client. And if you look at the pages folder, so that's default folder for uh, Next.js, you can see the index TZX file. And so here uh, we include the models and the hooks. Those are generated in the Wondergraph folder. And this is the generated client. So uh, for one, we have the add message mutation. And what you can see here is that on success, 
like when the mutation is successful, we actually want to refetch all mounted queries. So all queries that are currently mounted, so that means they are active, they are in the view, they should be invalidated on success. So that's important to immediately refresh the chat. And the second one is, you see, a use live query directive or, or use live query hook that gives us the messages. So that's the, the messages query. So you have this naming pattern in Wundergraph. So you always name things like queries. And from those names, we generate uh, the TypeScript client. OK, so you have use live query. That gives us a live update on the last 20 messages. So we keep, uh, uh, we use polling in the backend. You can configure the polling interval in the operations config. So in this phase, uh, in, in this case, we have a polling interval for live queries for two seconds, but you can adjust it to your needs. So we keep polling the database in the backend. And yeah, so here we get the messages. Uh, we use a use state uh, directive to cache the messages. And then some very basic uh, forms. So we, we iterate the messages if they are if they are good. And one more thing to mention here, you see we have this method login.github. And so how do we get to this message? If you look at the authentication config, you have the cookie based authentication. And here we can pass in a bunch of auth providers. We have a demo auth provider. That's a GitHub auth provider. You can also say auth providers, you can create your own auth for GitHub, Google, or any OpenID Connect if you want. In this case, we just use the demo auth provider. Uh, that's our GitHub demo uh, auth2 client. And yeah, that's basically the application. So we have this mutation here. If we click on the button for send messages, we put in the input for message. And you can see from the generated types, if we activate auto completion, we can only pass in the message. There's no way of passing in uh, name or email. Okay, so we pass in the message, we hit the submit button, and then the message gets added. And if that's fine, we set the, the message input to empty string. And uh, in case the load message status is OK too, we update the local cached messages. We just reverse them so that it actually looks like a chat and not otherwise. Yeah, so going back to the example, test two, we hit the submit button, get another test message, can log in again, test three, and that's basically it. So if you want to try this out, go to Wondergraph, go to the docs, scroll down to the examples, clone the repo, and then have some fun. I hope to see you soon. And if you have any questions or whatsoever, uh, then you can join our Discord, or you can book a demo. So that's a chat with me if you want, and you can get some further info. All right. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.